2015, my friend Christelle and I, both South African doctors, won the first ever Aspen Idea Award, a crowdsourced idea challenge that received more than 100 entries, generated over 10,000 public votes, and ended in a four-minute pitch tournament in front of a panel of expert judges and a live audience in Aspen, Colorado. We're no good for each other, Christelle and I. We're both super ambitious and believe that, by faith, we are capable of achieving things that psychiatrists would ordinarily term delusions of grandeur. We share a common dream to see dignity restored to our continent in our own lifetime. We believe that we are that turning point generation, the ones we have been waiting for, and maintain that if our generation has anything to do with it. This current state of affairs is not the way it will always be for our beloved Africa. And so it was with this outrageous resolve that we entered the Aspen Idea Award, with the hope that the seed grant would allow us to begin the process of curbing the towering tide of preventable maternal deaths that are threatening the foundations of many of our African communities. Our vision is to set up mobile ultrasound scan clinics in remote and rural parts of low-income settings so that antenatal health care can be made more easily accessible to pregnant women who cannot ordinarily access this very basic but life-saving package of preventative healthcare services. Our Onum Totowako clinics, which means see your baby in Kiswahili, will allow moms-to-be to connect to their unborn child through ultrasonography, free of charge. And whilst they enjoy this precious opportunity, they will be offered screening and treatment for pregnancy-related high blood pressure, malaria, and HIV, all of which contribute significantly to the unacceptably high levels of maternal death in these parts of the world. So that women, women just like ourselves, women with dreams, women with aspirations and ambitions of their own, women who are the cornerstones of their families and communities, would stop dying senselessly and needlessly, because we know what needs to be done. And as far as Crystal and I were concerned, it just needs doing. So confident was I about our plans that I started writing this TED talk about our feasibility study in rural DRC long before I even left for the DRC. I knew what I wanted this talk to be about. It was going to be a talk about Africans doing things for themselves, Africans taking back control, Africans helping and supporting each other and restoring our continent to its rightful place on the world stage. I knew what I wanted to find and what I was going to say about what I found when I came back. Going was just a formality. We'd done all our pre-reading. We'd had endless email exchanges with anyone and everyone who could give advice on the concept. We'd met with experts. We had close local contacts on the ground, and even extended family of crystals still living in this very rural and very remote part of the DRC. We are, after all, medics, your typical conscientious type A's that read the instruction manual from cover to cover before using a new remote control. <laughs> but nothing, 
nothing could have prepared us, could have prepared me for the lived reality of hardship the people of Jumbe were wrestling with on the ground. No electricity, no running water, no sanitation, no roads, no free health care, not even for the extremely poor, not even for a child with raging malaria. No oxygen, not in the clinics, not in the referral hospital, not anywhere. No refrigerator in the hospital to keep drugs. No safe equipment. Not much equipment at all. Not even a blood pressure cuff. And although I wouldn't have dared to say it out loud, and I'm even embarrassed to admit it here, as I lay under my mosquito bed net that first night and thought about all the children with malnutrition we had seen, I was tempted to conclude that, worst of all, there was no hope. Medics are fixers. We're trained to make things better. I get a thrill out of putting things right. And here I didn't know where we would start. And suddenly, five hours away from the nearest town, a three days drive from Kinshasa, miles and miles away from home. We no longer felt like winners of the Aspen Idea Award, but rather specks of foolishness, specks of naivety, childish to think that two girls from Pretoria could turn tides and change the world. And at that moment, that moon that we thought we could take a shot at disappeared from the sky. It's one thing to attempt to take a shot at the moon. But what do you do when you can't see the moon? When it seems as if there is no moon? You shoot at the dark night of the soul. You shoot at the dark night of disillusionment. As an act of defiance against the dark night of despair, in protest to the dark night of fear. Because moon or no moon, the dark night of injustice must be overcome. So after a series of pep talks amongst the team, we dusted ourselves off got up to the sound of roosters at dawn and continued as planned. We met local healthcare workers. We joined the doctors for a ward round. We spoke to patients. And then when we thought that we had ticked off everything on our list and that day's work was done, we were told we're going to a wedding. A wedding? Yes, a wedding. Now, to call me an introvert is a huge understatement. My least favorite place to be is between books. So the idea of a wedding, a massive social situation in a foreign country, with my three-word vocabulary of the Della, was a far more intimidating exercise for me than trying to set up a mobile maternal health clinic in a fragile state. But to the wedding we went. A beautiful occasion that was attended by what seemed like everyone in the community. An occasion that was testament to the resilience and fierce optimism of a community that lives with much less than many of us here today can even comprehend. And as we sat there, not fixing things, not making things better, but just enjoying the privilege of being welcomed into a community, enjoying the privilege of sharing in a meal 
generously provided. Listening to music played through a sound system powered by solar energy. I felt ashamed at how quickly I had been discouraged at the first stumbling block when here was a community that lived those stumbling blocks every day but had a lightness of being and a hopefulness that was puzzling. That night, we prepared the questions for the interviews with healthcare workers that we would be conducting the following day. Most of the questions were bread and butter, obstetric emergency management questions. But we did throw in a couple of character questions, one of which was a suggestion of mine. Why do you think you are the best person for the job? I don't speak very much French, so in these interviews, I had to rely largely on observation, some sporadic translation, and the rest of the team's judgment as my partner, Christelle, led the interviews. When my question was asked, I witnessed how nearly every single interviewee struggled, almost reeled back from it. At first, I thought they didn't understand the question. And when it was explained, why do you think you should be selected for this role over all the other candidates? Their discomfort was palpable. And despite much encouragement and even permission to display a tiny weeny bit of arrogance, to give us a pitch and share what sets them apart from the rest of their colleagues, all interviewees, without exception, were stumped and answered, without answering really, by reiterating that, as they'd said before, they wanted to help their community. Upon reflecting on those interviews, I realized why this trip had initially been so hard for us, for me. I was seeing all the things that were not there, and not what was there in great abundance. I was seeing what stood between us and achieving a reduced mortality statistic, and not the people and their relationships to each other, and the relationship that they were inviting us into, and the tremendous strength that lay in those relationships. In the world of plenty, we take for granted that all that we have, and all that we can do, and all that we have achieved is because of our great singular ability to take shots at the moon and come out triumphant. But that is, of course, not true. There are many cosmic bodies that together light up the night sky. Acts of courage, acts of defiance by hundreds and thousands of others, some small, some large, some seen, many unseen, but shots into the night that pierce the sky and light it up nonetheless. I realize now that the moon at times can be a distraction. The moon lights up the sky, and when it is in the fullness of its glory, reflecting the light of the sun, nothing seems impossible. But it waxes and it wanes, and sometimes it waxes real slow. One cannot hang one's hopes on the brightness of the moon. Instead, one must derive one's motivation from a dissatisfaction and an impatience with the dark night, whatever that dark night might be for you. Our Onum Totowako dream now shines brighter than it ever did before, a little bit like those cosmic bodies, those stars that we spoke of earlier not because of any exceptional abilities of mine or crystals, not because we brought in more experts or more funding, or even more theories, but because it now stands way up high on the shoulders of a community of giants. It's all systems go for a pilot in 2016, despite the challenges, in spite of the challenges 
to spite the challenges. We now have our A-team of local village-based healthcare workers who we will be working alongside to make this dream a reality. We're still the same two girls from Pretoria, bent on changing the world. But thanks to the people of Jumbe, we're doing it just that little bit wiser. Lusaka, thank you. Thank you.